Okay, let's begin. Sensors are more affordable than ever. So are practical ways to obtain useful information from your factory floor. Information that's never been as available, as accurate, as clear. Information you can use to solve long-standing problems to optimize, your to optimize your operation. Over our next 45 minutes, we'll be going over how sensors, as part of a data collection system, can help you to visualize, uh, to see what's really going on in your plant. What you're going to learn is that it doesn't cost as much as you think to get started. There are basic things you can implement in-house, and that affordable options exist right now for turnkey solutions to get you real-time information to solve common problems. In this webinar, three speakers will each tell stories about how data collection systems they've created have shed light into formerly dark corners of a factory. But first, let's, let's review concepts and terms that you'll hear throughout these talks. There are four elements to a data collection plant visualization system. The first is sensors. Sensors, they're everywhere. They're all over your car, they're nonstop in a hospital. Some are installed and operate in your business today. The news is that there are now dozens of new affordable ones that might help you in the factory, on it on a machine or in places, different places in the plant. They measure lots of different kinds of things. You'll see many examples in the talks this morning, including a camera. Second element is connectivity. This, this refers to the method of relaying data from sensors to a database where it's stored and analyzed. It can be wired. Uh, more often, this, this system is wireless, that is data flows via Wi-Fi to a modem in your plant and then via the internet to a cloud server. Uh, third element, analytics. This refers to the translation of the data into information that you can use. It's usually achieved what, through what's called machine learning. That's a process that a human starts and enables a computer to learn automatically and without future human intervention. In short, it's how meaningful, informa meaningful information of value to you is automatically created from hours of raw data. Fourth element is visualization, or in other words, what's the best way to see this new information? There's lots of options. Uh, this, they range from bar graphs on an iPad near an, that you might put by an operating console to uh, perhaps live results versus KPIs on a four-foot LCD above a work center, or maybe to an audible alarm on your iPhone. The point here is that each of these elements can be customized to fit applications uh, to help you to get the information you need to solve problems in your factory. Now let's hear how this is being done, being done in Northeast Ohio. And our first speaker is Dave Robinson. Dave is a Director of Business Information and Technology at Royal Chemical. In this role, he drives change that leads to better information that improves process efficiencies, decision making, and visibility into workloads throughout his organization. Please welcome Dave Robinson. Hi, Ed. Uh, this is Dave Robinson, as you mentioned. Um, you know, just one thing, I, I don't know if your slides are changing, Ed. Uh, I've got the data collection and plant visualization still up. I don't see my slide on there. I see your slide up, Dave. Um, so why don't you go ahead and proceed? Okay. Um, it's, it's hard to do without my, my slide up there. Uh, but so I guess just an introduction. My name is Dave Robinson. Uh, we've, at Royal Chemical, we're a contract manufacturer. 
Uh, one of the things we've been trying to do for the past year and a half, two years, uh, is understand the profitability and, and labor content of each of our lines. And we have been trying to solve this problem for a while now. Uh, again, given, given the nature of our business, we run all different types of products and different product lines. And we are trying to understand each the variables in each one of them. It's never consistent. We want to know how much utilization for each uh, machine, but not only machine on our labor, uh, how how it's being used for each job. And we've been trying to do so for the last several years uh, using things like iPads. Um, and you know, prior to that, we were using paper uh, and trying to collect it and put it into Excel. Uh, so our journey has been quite the challenge. Uh, we went from manual handwritten data, which was captured and then transferred manually to a spreadsheet. Uh, you had people pencil whipping, uh, you know, left and right, as you'd imagine. You'd get uh, people starting at 8 a.m. And, and noon, and you'd ask how, how they were able to do that with two different jobs at the same time. Uh, it wasn't physically possible. Uh, so we started to explore other options. We did that uh, by do, going to... The iPads out on the floor, we put iPads across our country. We've got five facilities across the, the nation. We put these iPads out there, and they had um, manual they had buttons to start the start and stop machine in labor time. All right? And they still had some of the same errors that you were getting before. Uh, you were having people go through, you know, forget to clock out during labor, forget to clock, clock in after uh, lunch, and and you were still getting inaccurate information. Let's see if I can. I'm still trying to get into the slide, Ed. Um, Dave, I currently have your slide up that says iPads around the planet with a scheduled job there and the summarized okay. view of the schedule in progress. All right. So if we move to the next slide, uh, what, you know, you can see. What we were struggling with is in certain areas we had strong plant management and other ones we didn't. So in the areas that you didn't have uh, strong plant management or it wasn't the fact that they were strong, it's that they were trying to monitor, you know, 75 people across the plant, uh, which becomes difficult as you'd imagine. Uh, you'd still get the things, um, you'd still get issues where you had, you know, you expected it to be 138 minutes and it'd still come back and you got 2,000 minutes. You're trying to figure out what happened. All right. So... We then started to explore other options. So if we go to the next slide where it says Raspberry Pis and Python, all right, uh, there's some inexpensive devices out there that are less than $150 uh, total. And with, uh, with those, you can really program them to, to do anything you want to do in the IoT world. Uh, it doesn't take much more than a day or two of YouTube and to get you started. Uh, you can do temperature, humidity, gas, moisture, vibration. Uh, as you can see, there's a, there's a, very various options you can do uh, to help you monitor your plant. One of the things that we've actually tried or we're, we're trying to implement is visual detection using it. So again, it took about two days of uh, Google and YouTube to figure this out. I am not a true programmer by nature, and I was still able to figure it out. So if we go to the next slide, to the video analytics, um, what you see here is just a snapshot example of uh, two of our guys after work uh, hanging out in the stretch wrapper area. You can see the green boxes around them, counting them as two people, identifying them as people in that zone. And it streams, if you go to the next uh, slide and play the video, um, you can see it streams real time to our management dashboard for everybody to see the count of people that are in a particular area at that time. And so if you had to, you could have it for, you know, we've got 100 different assets across the company, if we, we could, in theory, put 100 different charts up there and you knew exactly where your labor was. And not only that, it drops the database in the background that we can do analytics on over uh, the course of the year to understand how our throughput rates were doing. Uh, taking it a step further, we've, we've, uh, if you move to the next slide, those models can be trained to not only identify people, but they can identify objects and really get detailed. So here's an example of the OpenCV. It's called the TensorFlow. Training the uh, card deck to understand it's not only a card, but it's a queen, it's a jack, it's a nine. You can use these for facial recognition. People are using them for facial recognition to help control their pick list and identify who's working on a particular job. And uh, if we move to the next slide, 
uh, you can use it for object counting, right? So if we hit play, you'll see a cool little video here where it's been trained to identify different types of uh, product, Crush and, and Sprite, and it'll tell you how many are in there, and you can stream them up to your database to understand the count. So if you think about the application here, um, put it on your conveyor belt and count the number of objects going across the line and identifying and, and getting real throughput rates, uh, not just the kind of a summary at the end of the day where they tell you they did 200 cases, but if you if you dug a little deeper, uh, you'd see that they did you know 50 of those cases in a half hour, another half hour they may have been doing something else where they could have got 50 more cases. All right. Uh, so our thing from Royal Chemical, uh, I guess the advice to to everybody else is, you know, if you choose one thing to one thing or process you'd like to monitor and make sure there's a good management around implement. So if you implement it and the supervisors or the middle management doesn't believe in it or doesn't communicate it well enough, uh, then the then oftentimes it, it just doesn't work. So it took us about a year and a half to learn that lesson. Now we're very good at it. Uh, it's something that's incorporated in our daily world to, to review uh, the data and take a look at it uh, and understand what's going on with it. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the uh, next presentation. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Matt Yulepic is founder of eSystems. It's a company that brings cloud and sensor technology to manufacturers to, cre to increase their machine uptime. Its unique and easy to deploy solution is currently operating at 15 Ohio manufacturers, identifying hidden capacity, improving employee engagement, and increasing revenue. Please welcome Matt Yulepic. Hello. Um, so, my, uh, can you guys hear me? Because this just crashed on my end, and I can't see anything you're showing. Am I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear okay. you. All right, Ann, so you're going to drive, and I'm just going to assume that you're on the slide. <laughs> so, I tell you what. so as Ed said, my name is Maggie Lepic. I'm the founder of eSolutions, um, and we created an IoT solution that brings smart manufacturing to production facilities um, in a package that's easy to deploy, works on all your machines, um, is extremely affordable, and another key thing is that gaining the value from it um, is also very simple. It requires no, you know, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet experience, and you're not, you know, having a dozen mouse clicks to understand where your uptime and downtime opportunities lie. Next slide. So I'm not sure how many of you guys attended IMTS uh, this past year, but when I was there, um, there were key elements of our solution to smart manufacturing that differentiated our product because we broke down the technology barriers of adoption. Um, we were focused on the ease of connectivity for all machinery with sensors that provide real-time data to increase efficiency and optimize the manufacturing process. Next slide. So this slide, you know, we recognize that some of the technologies of the past um, have developed an unwelcome reputation, and by no means is our solution, you know, a big brother type of solution, and we'll I'll talk about that uh, here in a second. But, you know, with Industry 4.0 and smart manufacturing, they're really different. And for eSolution, um, they represented an opportunity to get actually more out of our employee team through collaboration around objective data. And then using the real-time element of this data, we create a better understanding of our production process. Next slide. So, and just to double check, you're looking at a picture of uh, employees? Yes. Okay, good. So our machine utilization tracker customers um, really value the experience and expertise of their employees. And being transparent with the data that is easy to understand, um, they're able to collaborate together objectively in a manner that sort of builds this growth mindset culture. We're hearing about this a lot uh, lately. And so a key tenant to our solution 
business collaboration. And we perform a 60-day trial where we coach on how to fit this collaboration into your culture. So the messaging is one of positive. You know, again, this is not a big brothers type of tool. This is really uh, a data set of information to promote um, collaboration. Next slide. So we hear terms like IoT and IoT. You know, what is the industry industrial Internet of Things? Well, you know, it's sensors that track things in our environment to help us be more efficient with our time and work smarter. So in the same way, we add sensors to the machines to help us identify efficiency opportunities in our production process. In our solution, we utilize machine learning algorithms to recognize the state of the machine. You know, is the machine making chips or not from the electrical activity? Um, and we focus on the most impactful component of your revenue, um, maybe a negative impactful uh, component, and that's unexpected downtime. Our device deploys without any rewiring of the machine and installs in minutes. Typically, our customers install them themselves and they start receiving uh, insightful information uh, literally in minutes. Next slide. Part of that data transparency is making the information easy to understand. Muck customers are not burdened with mining data and analyzing spreadsheets and gathering reports. Um, we use a very visual and intuitive approach to gain value from the information uh, that's being processed by the devices and coming from the machine. Next slide. eSolutions is using the latest web graphics and 3D gaming technology so we can show the many dimensions of downtime and uptime data visually. And from any phone, tablet, PC, from anywhere and at any time, it's easy to grasp the, the vitals of your production process in real time. Next slide. So transparency is a key component to our solution. Our on-floor displays contribute significantly to capacity increases. Many of our customers have identified a type of self-awareness the operator developed in understanding how their time management skills impact the production. Some customers have incentivized as a result of this, and they have shown significant gains in their capacity as a result. Next slide. Our dashboard tracks the data for as long as we monitor the machine, and the machine selector on the left provides a single machine, a cell, or a production-wide view of the data. This allows our customers to understand the impact of their efforts in leveraging the MUT data. Next slide. So in 2018, we were honored when we won the NTMA Technology Award because our solution deploys effortlessly the UI data is easy to understand, and we have shown that on average our customers experience a 15% increase in utilization. And at the bottom there, just list a handful of our Cleveland customers. As I mentioned, we have um, about 14, so even the slide's a little bit out of date. Next slide. It's important that eSolutions machine utilization tracker demonstrates value for our customers. And we believe it does so significantly. At $50 per machine per month, the 10x return is very reasonable as shown by this graphic. And if finding workers is your challenge today, leveraging that same 5% of fitting capacity is like having a new hire. Next slide. So if you're interested in our 60-day trial, visit our website or send me an email and we could send uh, much to you to try on your equipment. And you don't just work on CNC machines. We monitor welders, water, and laser jets, presses, crimpers, saws, uh, you name it. We'll get you the real-time data to increase your capacity. Thanks again, Ed, and thank uh, everybody for uh, taking the time to listen. Thank you, Matt. Our next speaker is Prince Ghosh. Prince is founder of Boundary Labs, an IoT and big data startup here in Cleveland. 
This company focuses on digitizing factory floors, solving for machine metric tracking, condition monitoring for machine health, predictive maintenance. Originally from Princeton, New Jersey, Prince received his BS in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering from Case. Please welcome Prince. Hi, everyone. Are you uh, able to hear me all right, Ed? Loud and clear. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining. So, like Ed said, uh, my name is Prince Ghosh, and I am a co-founder of Boundary Labs. Uh, we are, as he said, a big data and IoT startup uh, focused on delivering a full vertically integrated solution um, for machine monitoring and predictive analytics uh, surrounding your entire factory floor. So our core goal is to deliver a really simple, easy to use, and uh, value-driven IoT and big data solution that helps you drive insights from your factory floor, uh, increase productivity, reduce unscheduled machine downtime, and uh, at the end of the day, drive bottom line revenue for uh, manufacturers. Next slide, please. So uh, the main issues that we kind of identified um, by working with some early partners was centered around these four main points. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers, um, you know, perhaps some of those in the audience today, we found often rely on manual inspection of the factory floors. So routine uh, pencil and paper and clipboard um, check-ins, uh, preventative maintenance. So once every two weeks, checking out um, and doing a maintenance rundown or changing out a tool once every 200 production runs as per the statistical lifetime given to the machine. Um, this is kind of compounded with the fact that uh, unscheduled machine downtime is, you know, as I'm sure you all know, a huge expense for your man for you all as manufacturers. Um, this results in lost production, but the biggest issue that we really have kind of centered our solution around is this last part. Uh, the fact that current data output systems, so if you have SCADA or PLC systems coming up to your CNC machines, um, yes, you can tap into the system using a data logger. But oftentimes, that's really hard intervention to implement. Uh, forget at one, well, forget at scale, but even for one machine on a factory floor. And more so, uh, a lot of those data points come out as kind of this big lake of just unstructured, unintelligent data, um, more so. So what we are really focused on is delivering a cost-effective solution uh, that is able to vertically integrate into your existing factory floor plans and um, operations that you guys use, but is able to make sense of all of this unstructured data coming off of the plant. Next slide, please. So uh, our approach to this is through a sensor suite and uh, big data platform. Uh, so this image on the right is one of our sensors. It's uh, also based on a Raspberry Pi architecture, kind of like what uh, was just spoken about a couple of, a couple of presentations ago. But um, we have essentially configured these Raspberry Pis to include uh, sensors that measure points of failure, such as vibration, uh, temperature, humidity, um, those sorts of things that come off of the machine natively. They slap right to the side of the machine, and uh, we actually deploy both um, either cellular native connections, if you don't have Wi-Fi on a factory floor, or uh, Wi-Fi connections for the those manufacturers that we've worked with that uh, do have Wi-Fi natively on the factory floor and wish for us to use them. So really configurable on either side. Um, and the way that we translate all this data is uh, through this user experience dashboard on the left. Um, so we configure dashboards to output metrics that are key to the uh, clients that we work with um, to show real-time production statistics, uh, real-time temperature, vibration monitoring, um, humidity monitoring. But we actually are able to take it a step further and uh, integrate in with third-party uh, providers that help us um, actually automate sending out text messages or phone calls or emails to a shop supervisor or a shift manager um, as soon as the first signs of a machine acting out of order are detected. 
So you can kind of think of this like what an Apple Watch or a Fitbit does uh, for you and your heart rate. So kind of monitors your heart rate. You put it on. It thresholds your heart rate to see what a good resting heartbeat is. Uh, we essentially do the same thing with industrial machines. Um, we put our sensors on. We let them detect the vibration signals and the temperature ranges coming off the machines. They're able to autonomously statistically threshold uh, a high value and a low value and then send out those text messages or phone calls or emails if a uh, extraneous value or anomaly that is indicative of an impending machine shutdown is detected. Next slide, please. So uh, I thought I would my time would best be spent today um, by more so going through a couple of case studies of uh, existing sites and partnerships and uh, plants that we're on to kind of show you all um, a couple of the metrics that we mentioned. So in this first plant that we're in, um, what what our partner uh, was really interested in monitoring was um, the health of his gearbox on some of his multi-spindle lathes on his factory floor. So in this case, we were looking to monitor rolling bearing elements, uh, race elements, um, looking for a shaft misalignment in the gearbox. Uh, we, in that process, are actually able to start measuring production metrics through these sort of repetitions. So right every time the machine goes through a production cycle, there's a very unique set of vibrational signals, um, and those kind of repeat over time. So based on that, we can start automating the data collection for production uh, uh, processes as well. Um, so the core of you know the core objective of monitoring the gearbox for uh, potential failure points was to reduce unscheduled downtime. So to catch a small uh, error in the gearbox or small mechanical failure point and fix it before it became too big um, and required you to one shut down the machine. Two, drove the gearbox to complete catastrophic failure. So if such an event would have uh, resulted in a factory like this in about three weeks of lost production um, between ordering a new part, ordering a new gearbox altogether, getting the right technicians onto the factory floor, and going through the installation process. Uh, but the interesting point that kind of came out of this was um, this factory specifically was actually able to use the production data we were monitoring to feed into their key performance indicators for dynamically pricing their technicians bonuses. So they use, you know, a simple equation of total production hours times parts produced per hour times some efficiency factor, and that's how uh, they structure their incentivization metrics for their technicians and operators. Um, up till now, they've been relying on pencil and clipboard data, uh, like what Matt said, you know, oftentimes not, not fully reliable. Um, what we were able to do is kind of push them away from that manual data collection and entry process and automate that entire uh, portion that feeds into their metrics. Next slide. In uh, the second case study, uh, we've actually been working with a partner manufacturer uh, to build out a new custom dashboard for them, uh, which is why this kind of looks different from the old one. Um, in this case specifically, uh, our partner company was looking to monitor machine production and health not on a single individual machine, but more so along a production uh, line, a full production line, so going from one machine to another. Uh, the objective here was to really try and find the bottlenecks um, in the overall production. So from just, you know, some basic operation engineering, uh, being able to find that theory of constraints, right, in your overall production line and figure out which machine is causing the bottleneck that is reducing your overall throughput. Um, so that's what we were working on with these manufacturers to monitor essentially machine health as a part went from one machine to another to a third. Uh, we also have developed out uh, a REST API. So to put it in really simple terms, a REST API is a short piece of code that lets you integrate data points from one system into another. Uh, in this case, we developed out an API that let the manufacturer actually take the data points coming off of our sensors and our big data platform and re-ingest them into their native ERP system. So I believe they use um, Job Bus as an ERP in this factory floor. So we were actually able to help the manufacturers take these data points and feed them back into their overall ERP uh, with the eventual objective of not only automating uh, finding these production bottlenecks, but also automating things like their supply chain rates. So 
uh, having spare parts on the shelf before a machine actually breaks and making sure that you're never uh, pushing a machine too far or too close to when or you don't you do or you do not have a spare part on the back end. So really trying to go to uh, finding that optimized um, machine maintenance period and overall solution. Next slide, please. And uh, the third case study here was uh, a little different, um, and we have been working with this manufacturer over the past couple of weeks to do kind of a, almost a custom-built solution um, that we have been exploring uh, as a company as something, you know, to see if there's broader interest from in the general community. But uh, in this case, this manufacturer is a small axle manufacturer, so manufactures axles for things like um, – golf carts and small vehicles, things like that. Uh, the two core focuses of what we, what, what this manufacturer was looking for with our solution was um, one, tool monitoring, and two, heat treatment monitoring. So they currently run a bunch of processes on one of their CNC lathes. Um, there's an inbuilt statistical tool replacement metric that says you should be replacing a tool once every 200 pieces. Uh, the technicians who have been using those tools for the last 40 years know for a fact that that is not what the actual tool life of any of these machines is. Um, the big issue that the shop floor manager and the president of the company had, uh, and the reason that we started this partnership of working together was because uh, they recognized that there was almost too much of a dependency on that inbuilt tribal knowledge of the technicians and operators um, hearing when a tool was about to break and then replacing it. Uh, which is, you know, something great overall. Um, but the big issue there is, one, what happens when your workforce retires uh, or you lose an employee who's been on the factory for 15 years. Two, um, it creates a dependency on the workers directly to run a process. So the big issue here was uh, two-phased again. One, they wanted to look at ways of how they could reduce unscheduled downtime by extending the overall tool lifetime. So to actually use vibrations and uh, acoustic signals in this case to detect when a tool was about to fail and replace it right before it did fail as opposed to replacing it preemptively or uh, far too late and causing scrap production. But also uh, in this case what we found was we were able to achieve um, close to a 20% labor reallocation uh, so in this case, uh, the technicians and operators, they would actually shut the machines off during lunchtime when they went to lunch because they were so afraid that something uh, would happen that they wouldn't catch. Um, this was, you know, 30 minutes a day, about 15 axles produced in 30 minutes. So the numbers very quickly add up. Um, by just having this sort of remote monitoring, uh, what we were able to do is help the manufacturer and the president of the shop uh, reallocate um up to 20% of, you know, overall labor is the basic calculation that we have right now. So, again, looking at ways to optimize your workforce and see how you can drive higher production metrics. Uh, and the last point on this slide was um, a little bit uh, different of a typical solution, but in this process, they actually run heat treatment as the last step in their uh, production cycle before they ship out their axles. Um, what we've been working with them over the last couple of weeks to do is develop out actually an infrared sensor base. Uh, heat treatment monitoring and threshold processing. So again, going back to that remote monitoring, the ability to have eyes and ears on every corner of your factory floor uh, and detect potential failures at their earliest stages is the centric um, message of what we're trying to drive here. Next slide, please. Uh, again, so my name is Prince Gosh, uh, co-founder of Boundary Labs, um, really trying to push the value of data-driven decision-making on industrial factories, uh, but name and email are there, more than happy to uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Let's take a few minutes to answer some questions. Uh, in the audience, please feel free to use the chat box to pose yours. Uh, I've got a couple that I'd like to start with. Uh, Dave Matt Prince, in uh, 25 words or less, what excites you most about this technology? Who wants to go first? I'm happy to. Uh, go. go ahead. Uh, hey, how about you just pick? All right, Matt, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, 
I get excited when I uh, bring a new customer on board and inevitably they discover capacity almost within days of from seeing the real-time data. It really is a transformation of the difference when you used to use paper maps to navigate a city to your real-time GPS uh, that's giving you live updates on traffic conditions um, so you can navigate the city better. It's, it's the same thing with my manufacturing customers. As soon as they have that data in their hand, it, it's like a no-brainer of what they need to do differently and how to improve and um, I get excited when they almost instantly get like a five percent lift in capacity, and then we start to work with them on some of those other collaboration techniques that I spoke of to get that you know another ten fifteen percent more. Real time data, Dave. Uh, what's what's your reaction to this technology? Well, I, I think that's uh, for us the, the two things, right? It's the real time data that alerts you of what's going on with your factory floor. Uh, you know, for manufacturing like us, uh, we've got five plants across the country. You got hundreds of assets out there, and it's hard to monitor uh, from a high level. Uh, and it gives you the truth, right? You, you wonder what your throughput rates or your labor utilization rates are. Uh, there's no arguing with the with the data on on technology like this if you have the right sensors out there. You're not relying on people. Uh, to input the data, um, but also you're freeing those guys up from having to input the data. Uh, tasks that those guys, uh, the production guys, don't usually want to do because they don't ultimately use the value of the data. Uh, now it gives everybody kind of the freedom to to use it and and not have to be bothered with it. Thanks, Prince. Uh, for me, it's the most exciting part to me is probably um, the unexpected outcomes that suddenly uh, pop up when you try implementing some of these things. So everyone kind of uh, goes in to implementing an IoT solution thinking that, hey, there's this one specific problem we want to solve. Um, and inadvertently, a lot of the time, you uh, end up solving not only that problem, but figuring out, oh, wow, here's another benefit. Um, one of my favorite cases is the one that you know I just mentioned where we were looking to predict tool life failure, uh, ended up being able to help reallocate overall labor, right? So that's like getting an extra worker on your factory floor, an extra, an extra 30 minutes back in uh, production value every day. So it's kind of those unintended consequences that seemingly spring up from having these sort of remote solutions that uh, really excites me. The... The allure of this is neat, but uh, what about cost? Let's talk about cost a minute. Dave, you referred to you referred to equipment that you were purchasing. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the affordability of of sensors and uh, and Raspberry Pis? Yeah, so um, you know the Raspberry Pis, and, and once you buy the the initial unit, you can you can get them for less than a hundred dollars, and then all you have to do is free up a little bit of programming time in order to configure it the way you want it. Uh, typically, the sensors that are added, you can you know you can take the initial computer, the Raspberry Pi, that's, again, less than $100 total. Uh, you can buy sensors for 5 bucks a piece on Amazon and configure them any way you want. So humidity, heat, uh, load cells, and, and infrared, ultrasonic, you know, any of those things are cheap. Uh, it's easy, and it's a quick way to experiment to get you started in, in the IoT journey in manufacturing versus having to go out through another company and, uh, you know, implement a full-blown solution. Hey, Ed? Yes. Yeah, just to address cost, um, <clears throat> I, I definitely appreciate David's technical tenacity, and we've used Raspberry Pi in the past. Uh, most of my customers don't have any sort of IT budget. Um, a lot of them didn't have... Uh, email addresses to any sort of domain or anything like that. Certainly don't have two years to spend developing a, a solution. So we offer a very uh, competitively priced solution at uh, $50 per month per machine. And you know, from our calculations, a, even at a very modest $50 an hour shop rate, there should be no problem getting a 10x return on that investment. Now, Matt, I think what you're describing is interesting, and, and this uh, this whole notion of a subscription model to a data service is something that uh, not everybody listening to this webinar may be familiar with. Uh, 
I think our sense is that uh, if you want to buy a turnkey solution from a data company, then you're looking at uh, six figures, maybe seven figures of investment. Yeah. But what you're well, describing is something different. Do you want to talk about just the basics of a subscription service, Matt? Sure. So, you know, traditional software involves, um, you know, hardware investments and sort of uh, deployment investment to, to onboard your uh, machines and that sort of thing. And you're right, Ed. I, I just uh, watched a webinar where they, they showed a sheet of 30 machines cost $150,000 to get onboarded um, with that type of investment. And traditionally with those solutions, you have about a 30% annual maintenance cost or maybe another $50,000 a year. You know, today with the cloud, and again, my customers aren't interested in purchasing service servers and doing annual license agreements. Uh, so we shuttle everything to the cloud. Uh, it's very secure. And so the cloud resources are also based on a monthly subscription. And so that's, that's why we're structured that way. And again, we, we, it's in a, um, at a price point that you, you can't possibly deploy yourself. Um, and so that's why it's structured that way. Right. And Prince, your business also operates under a subscription model. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, it's a, you know, it's a very similar sort of thing. The core is, uh, pay a little upfront for the hardware. Um, but the core metric on the recurring model is the, uh, insights given by the software. So it's really, you know, what, what you pay is what you get, um, is oftentimes the misconception in, uh, sort of IoT big data world. And people oftentimes assume that you know, the only way to really get a good implementation is to pull in a six, seven figure solution from um, some big name like Bosch or Banner or uh, one of the other massive, um, you know, monitoring companies, uh, ABB, stuff like that. Um, but really, it's kind of what you've mentioned at the very beginning, Ed. Uh, we're kind of at this interesting period of time where Sensors have become so powerful and cheap. Uh, cellular connection has become so um, effective and cheap. And uh, computational processing power on the cloud has also become so powerful yet cheap. Um, so it's kind of this apex of the three that has enabled the sort of democratization of uh, IoT deployments at these really low cost points that um, almost instantaneously within months, if not weeks, generate ROIs. Thanks, Brent. Um, I see we've got a question in our question box. Uh, let me ask Dave, Prince, Matt. Um, there's a question about, is the generated data manageable directly from, from its native format, or would it require programming to get the mining done correctly, directly from the source? Who would like to take this one on? I could uh, I could address this. This is uh, kind of something that we based in one of our uh, customer sites. Okay, Prince. Uh, so the answer is kind of both, um, and it really depends on what it is uh, that an end customer is looking for. Uh, in one of the case studies that I mentioned above, where we were looking to identify bottlenecks in the production process, um, we started out by taking the end data points and delivering them in just Excel sheets uh, on a daily basis to the manufacturers, um, and they would hand, uh, kind of enter them into their ERP systems and ingest the data that way, um, and kind of close the overall value loop that way. Uh, what we ended up moving to then is deploying this API that I talked about, right? So that gateway uh, between two programs speaking to each other and interfacing. And that became uh, then kind of like a game changer, uh, where with about seven lines of programming code, um, the end user, and we were, you know, more than happy to work and configure this for them directly, was able to uh, real-time take our data and consistently and constantly ingest it into the ERP uh, without any of the additional hassle of, like, manual entry or um, excessive, you know, programming or hacking into the back end. So it, uh, what we, our personal approach has been um, one deliver not the raw data, but the most crucial insights. So what is actually, all this data is great and ones and zeros, you know, are fantastic, but what does that actually mean in the context of the factory floor? 
So that's the first part of it. And the second part of it is if you want to use that raw data for another process, so like within an ERP system, uh, okay, how do we make that as simple as possible? Okay. Thanks, Prince. Aaron is is uh, listed another question here uh, about the data collected is certainly appealing, but his concern is it's a, is the security and manageability of these devices. We've all heard that the S and IoT stands for security, and the FBI issues cybersecurity warnings related to IoT devices. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, Matt, you've been at this for a while. You have a comment? <laughs> so one of the reasons we've um, gotten, sort of gotten away from uh, more OS-based uh, devices is that we can really control the ingress to the device. So our particular device, um, like I said, we've, we've used Raspberry Pis, um, and they're fantastic. Um, I've actually used dozens of them. But um, once we offered it as a product, we minimized the, the device to something that offers very little in terms of a full OS capabilities, and in fact, we uh, build and compile all the um, code that's on it and offer absolutely no ingress to the device. So there's there's no remote accessing of the device. Um, someone can't, like, sit there and wirelessly get into the device. And so we've uh, purposely done that as a result of our security posture. And then the, on the data side, um, all of it is... Um, securely shuttled to AWS, and AWS has all their security facilities that we, we leverage to um, keep that data secure. But even in line with all of that, we purposely don't capture any sensitive data, no personal information, no financial data, uh, anything like that. Um, it, again, to sort of maintain our security posture from that aspect. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so let's um, let's come to conclusion. I think we'd say we c there's information that uh, from manufacturers have not had before about their business that's that's more available now via relatively simple systems that we've described today. I want to thank Matt and Prince and Dave for sharing their stories and what they've learned about how factory floors can benefit. Their contact information is listed on the screen that you see. Please feel free to reach out to them to learn more. Today's slides will be available to you through a follow-up email that you will receive. Also, for colleagues of yours who missed this session, this webinar will be accessible via our website. Click the technology page. Give us a couple days to get it up. And then uh, feel free to click the link. And lastly, I want, I want to know what you think about this program and about what else you'd like to see from Manufacturing Works in the future. Please drop me a note. Thanks, everyone. This concludes our program for today.